Hello everybody, my name is Mike Kalapsha and I have just recently returned from a privately guided safari throughout Namibia. We drove just over 2,000 kilometers and if you want to find out more about where we visited, what we got up to, what we saw, this is a video just for you. So as mentioned, we had an incredible time out in Namibia. It was a two week long adventure, which was kind of divided um, between luxurious safari and self-drive camping safaris, um, because it was very much an experiential type safari where you drive through a country by yourself, you set up your own campsite, you cook your own food, um, but then we ended in a very luxurious way at Wilderness Honeb Skeleton Coast Camp. So this two-week trip took us uh, kind of from the center of the country being Vintuk, where we started. We landed there, got our rental vehicle, which had two rooftop tents on, um, a fridge and all the kitchen um, supplies that you need in the back, uh, chairs, tables, the works. Um, and there we spent one night in Vintuk. We used this day to do our shopping and get everything we needed for the trip. Um, and we spent a night out um, at, or well, a night in at uh, Vintook Luxury Suites, which is a beautiful little guest house slash hotel, very convenient, very central, close to all the major shops um, and big routes out of Vintook. So that was our first night. From there, we took, um, oh, well, before we go on to the adventure, while in Vintook, we also had dinner at Joe's Beer House, which is an absolute must when visiting Vintuk. It is such a cool setup. It's very rustic. It's very, um, uh, yeah, it's just such a really cool experience eating local cuisine, um, great beer or any other drinks of preference. Um, and it's always so vibey. They've got hundreds of people uh, visiting this restaurant every single day. Um, so they are quite open and honest about just how incredible they are, but equally just how slow service can be at times just because it gets so busy. I mean, we were there in the middle of the week and there were tons of people, like massive motorcycle clubs rocked up in there. There was live music. There were like big families visiting, um, doing like, I don't know, kind of like reunion family dinners in the middle of the week. Maybe they had people from abroad visiting. Um, but yeah, tons of people. Outside was fully booked. Inside was pretty much full. So it is quite... Um, important to remember, if you'd like to visit this uh, restaurant and have a meal there, it is quite essential to make a booking before uh, you go in. But as I said, Vintuk first night, we had our night in Vintuk to do stock supply um, and fill up our fridge and then have dinner at Joe's Beer House. And then early the next morning, we made our way further south out of Vintuk um, to Sossel's Flay. It was about a four hour drive. Now, these drives seem long, um, and yes, they're long, but they are beautiful. It's so scenic driving through um, Namibia, and the four hours fly by really quickly because with every like 30 minutes, the terrain changes, everything looks different. Um, you're on a different kind of road, so for the most part, it's dirt road out there. Um, but I was joking around that the dirt roads in Namibia are better than the tar roads in South Africa. Um, but... A really fun experience driving around this country and we spent the first two nights in Cestrium campsite so now it's quite important to note as well when you go into um, Sossel's Flay that's where um, the first region we visited but the campsite's called Cestrium there are two gates there's one to the public which we then came through as we checked in because our campsite was within the first gate because then there's a second gate being the national park gate and this gate opens an hour before sunrise. And that's why we wanted to be camping. And if you're ever going for photographic purposes and you want to get in at the best light, stay inside the first main gate. Otherwise, you will only be coming into the park after sunrise. Um, and by that time, it's already quite warm. The light's disappearing. It takes you then an hour to get to Sossel's Flay or Dead Flay. So it's quite a drive. So it's important to stay in the Cestrium campsite. And our first two nights um, was rooftop camping, lots of fun, uh, private ablutions, 
setting up our own meals and dinners and breakfasts and lunches and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we obviously focused on making our way deep into the, um, into the National Park, focusing on two main activities um, down there. The first afternoon we went in, we decided we'll do Dead Flay first. Now, Dead Flay is a very cool area where, as you kind of crest the slight dune, there is like a dried, what looks like a salt pan, which um, is a riverbed, an old riverbed, which now no longer flows because the dunes have stopped the flow of this water. But the trees, due to this dry environment, still stand there and are still quite strong. Um, and the chances of them dying off any, well, not, they're already dead, but falling over and rotting off soon is not great because they have been standing there for estimated about 900 years plus. Due to this dry, um, arid environment, these trees don't kind of rot away and just um, return into the soils of the area. So very, very cool and a must-see when you go into the Sossels Flay region is this area called Dead Flay. And as I'd mentioned, we made our way in that afternoon. It was super hot, 37 degrees Celsius, and we walked past about four people. The second couple we walked past, we asked them, is there anyone else in Sossels Flay, oh, in Dead Flay, because there weren't many vehicles in the parking area, and they said, you're going to have it all to yourselves. So we crested over this hill, got into Dead Flay, and the first time I had visited Dead Flay, and every other time except that or this particular afternoon, there were tons of people. So photographing or taking videos without people kind of getting in your, your shot is pretty much impossible. We were super lucky that day. And it seems like going in late afternoon when it is still quite hot, many people are still resting in the shade, that's the time to just fight the heat a bit, get in there and have the absolute best time. And because as we started making our way out, did we then see a few people um, coming in, um, walking along dune edges and so on as it was cooling off. But we had a great time in Dead Flay with no one around. The next morning, um, we got up very early, folded up our tent, set up camp, because the tents are obviously on the roof of the vehicle. Um, and we got into line. There's a big line of vehicles waiting at that second gate, being the park gate, because this opens an hour before sunrise. And as soon as that opened, everyone made their way into the park. Some people turned off a bit earlier to Dune 40 or Dune 45. But our goal was to head straight to the end where we were um, in the Dead Flay region the previous afternoon, where Big Daddy was our target of the day. Now, Big Daddy is the tallest dune um, in the Sossels Flay region and the one that kind of everyone wants to summit and get up to the top and enjoy that view. And this was our this was our our goal that day, is to get in there as early as we could, for good light and cooler temperatures, and then climb this dune. And it was such a great experience. Um, and the route we took, obviously with moving along, stopping, taking a shot, catching our breath, moving along, taking a shot, catching our breath, took us just over an hour to get to um, the summit, to the top of of this dune, where we then spent a good amount of time. Um, walking right to the edge so that we can get no one else in our shots and get the views of um, the areas beyond and past Dead Flay um, and then obviously of Dead Flay itself, photographs of other people in this um, general area because that's what, I love the landscape in this area and photographing there is absolutely breathtaking uh, regardless as to the light conditions, you're going to get really cool photograph. But... The scale in this place is what really blows my mind. It's just how in this massive landscape or on a dune or whatever it may be, somewhere in there you see the small speck of a human. Um, and it's something I told Beat, if people are in your shot, don't worry about it because there's major value there. And let's photograph these people because that just shows off the absolute sheer scale of this place. It is unflippin' believable standing up on those dunes and seeing these people um, like little ants walking on the edge of this dune. It's just breathtaking. Um, and then if you really don't want them there, because they're so small in the frame, it's very easy to crop that out or to clone and heal that out if you really want to. But I believe it adds really good value. But speaking of adding really good value, there was a bit of a, a twist to our itinerary um, in Namibia now recently because we were going to do a helicopter flight from Swakopmund 
to the heli uh, to the skeleton excuse me let's try this one more time from Swakopmund to Sandwich Harbor um, and photograph the dunes and the the coastline like that but this company that we'd booked this with folded they were no longer at um, of service so we had to then change our plans and we this, we got in touch with a guy who does a lot of helicopter tours and photographic helicopter tours in Namibia and we managed to secure a helicopter flight around Sossel's Flay, which I I did a, a helicopter flight from Swakopmund to Sandwich Harbor two years ago, which was amazing. Um, don't get me wrong, but flying around the Sossel's Flay region to me was a lot um, more exciting. The landscapes were prettier, and the opportunities, photographic opportunities, were were incredible. Obviously, having having experiences. Um, um, landscape and photographing it at ground level being up in the sky photographing from up there was really cool um, because we got to see dead fly from the sky we could see big daddy and the areas we stood on the that very morning um, photographing and taking videos was really really cool and we opted for the hour and a half flight instead of the hour because the hour will just kind of get you in towards um, dead fly and you'll have to kind of turn and make your way back um but we got to enjoy the hour of flying around that area and spending more time around certain dunes that we were really enjoying. And then from there, we could kind of make our way further west into the heart of those big red dunes where there was more vegetation um, for animals to be feeding on. And Beata really wanted to find an oryx um, out in the dunes, which we were extremely lucky. We did get to find an oryx, um, a beautiful male standing on the side of a dune feeding he then ran over the dune down the side of the dune and then into this kind of plains area and he just stood there and looked at us it was an absolutely incredible moment and such a great thing to have ticked off because that's really what my guests wanted to experience and then from there we made our way back to the helipad we landed made our way back to camp where we prepped our dinner enjoyed our last evening of camping there before packing up early the next morning and making our way to Swakopmund. So this drive slightly longer, about 4.5 hours, but still, as I'd mentioned previously, it is. it doesn't feel that long because you're experiencing all these beautiful landscapes and driving around anywhere in Namibia is absolutely breathtaking. It's You're always going to have something to see. Um, so well worth driving it instead of flying from place to place. As soon as we, and our plan was, as soon as we arrived in Vintuk, um, Beata's vegetarian, the guest I was hosting, but she had mentioned, or she's always eaten fish on, on uh, safaris. Um, and I know two years ago we came, came across a, I wouldn't really call it a restaurant, it's a, it's a food truck called Fork and Nice. So Fork and Nice. Um, and the way we found it is we were looking for the best seafood in Swakopmund, and there's many great restaurants there, but this particular food truck has the best beer battered fish and very well priced, really cool setup right on the coastline, um, and a really, really tasty meal. Now, we had two nights in um, Swakopmund as well for some time to do laundry, some time to charge up batteries properly even though we had power at Sossel's Flare um, but a bit of a Namibian cultural feel if I may because it's got a big German um, influence in Namibia and particularly Swakopmund so we spent two nights there and our first night we went to dinner at Jetty 1905 which was a jetty that was built in 1905 um, but had been closed to the public for many, many, many years. They eventually renovated it, and now there's a restaurant right on the pier, right on the, the very edge, which is absolutely stunning and probably one of, if not the best restaurant in Swakopmund. And the second night, we went to Tiger Reef, which is yet another beautiful restaurant right on the beach, on the edge of town, overlooking the ocean as the sun sets, um, your feet in the sand, good music, good food, best calamari ever, Um and a really cool vibe. So it's a very um, kind of street nightlife kind of 
um, experience Swakopmund. It really is a cool place. Um, but our day in Swakopmund, because we only had one full day, we were supposed to do the helicopter flight to Sandwich Harbor. And because this didn't happen, we decided to still do Sandwich Harbor, but do it in a 4x4 vehicle. Um, even though we had a 4x4 vehicle, we decided to hire a guide who knew this area very well. And we went through a company, booked this tour, and it was a full day tour through to the Sandwich Harbor. And it started off with, um, or at the lake, at the close to the harbor in Volfers Bay, where you get to photograph some flamingo. Um, and then from that point onwards, you go past the salt pans of Namibia because they obviously have massive, um, a massive salt export and they create or have loads of salt in that country. And then from there, you keep going north towards Sandwich Harbor. And it's such a great experience driving along the beach, looking to your right, and you've got the ocean. Looking to your left, you've got these mammoth dunes um, to your left. So that's a really fun experience. But then also having the opportunity to stop the vehicle at any point, really get out, take photographs, walk along the dunes, um, get your composition right, or just enjoy the incredible amount of space that um, is given to you out there. And then at one point you go up way at the end of Sandwich Harbor, you get up to this highest point, which is like the viewpoint out there where you can enjoy um, the scenery, uh, look around uh, and just take that whole area in. Obviously, you need to watch out for vehicles, but they give you a few safety tips as to where to walk, how to walk in this area so um, you remain safe. But then once up there, we took a moment to sit down and just enjoy the view, and we were so blessed to, and we really wanted to see dolphin, um, and eventually we saw this massive pod kind of swimming um, in and amongst the waves and hunting, and they were kind of speeding around, but they weren't being all too um, acrobatic and lively in that sense. And at one point, this dolphin just leaps out the water, the second one leaps out, and this happened about three times for us. So that was very cool being able to sit up there. And by then, most of the people, I think it was just myself, Beata, and there was another couple there. Um, so there weren't many people. It wasn't all too loud. And we were the only ones up there enjoying um, the show that the Dolphin were putting on for us. Um, and then from that point, got back in the car and we made our way a bit further inland. We could still see the ocean, but we had our lunch out there, which was so beautiful, tasty lunch. And because the full day tour included our lunch, it includes all your drinks um, and your snacks and so on throughout the day. But a really cool way to just enjoy a lunch out in the dunes, literally in the middle of nowhere. Um, but yeah, a really cool experience. And like I'd mentioned, the we I flew over that area two years ago, which was equally as amazing. But having driven it now, I feel it's driving those dunes. I'd rather fly Sossel's Flare and drive um, at Sandwich Harbor because the driving is such a thrill. Um, you go down these dunes, which are so steep that you think your vehicle is going to tip over forwards. Um, when you race down and you kind of go along the bank of another dune and kind of turns and goes down your stomach you don't know where your stomach's sitting it's in your left shoulder then in your right knee and then in your ear and it's like it, everything is just all your senses are heightened and it's a great and fun experience and we really enjoyed that day um out in sandwich harbor great photography but also equally an incredible experience out there and we obviously got to spend time with a local guy being our guide. His name was Hannes, really informative in, um, chap. We really enjoyed our day with him. And he even gave us great advice for our road trip to Spitzkopper, which was our next destination. So two nights um, Sosselsfle, oh, excuse me, two nights Sosselsfle, two nights um, Swakopmund, all these S's. And then our next destination was only one night, but in Spitzkopper. But now, as I'd mentioned, Hannes gave us a great recommendation for a little area or detour we had to take through what he or what they call the moon landscape. And the moon landscape is beautiful. As you'd see in the video, it's it seems as if you're on the moon. It's super hot, super dry. And I would be very surprised if there's even an insect living in that area. <laughs> and there would be. Obviously, there needs to be life everywhere, but a stunning area. And as and it's only a 40 minute um drive to or through this area to an area called um Gaunikontes Oasis Rest Camp which 
Like I said, it's a 40 minute drive and a slight detour off the main road to, straight to Spitzkopper. But you go through that moon landscape, really pretty. And then you get to this rest camp, which is set up so well. It is such a cool vibe there. And I can imagine it being on a weekend, that place would be incredible to spend or to have a dinner at and have a few drinks. It really is a really cool um, little spot in literally the middle of nowhere. You go through this moon landscape, which is dead and arid, and there's nothing there. And you get into this valley, and then there's just the first thing you see is this thick, thick, thick band of green trees along this river. And that's where this place is situated. We had, we bought a takeaway lunch there, had a drink, and then we decided we'll make our way to Spitzkopper. So the whole route, um, without stopping at like the moon landscape viewpoints um, and at the rest camp, would take about just under two and a half hours. So it's a short drive from Swakopmund through to Spitzkopper. But our plan was to arrive early at Spitzkopper because the campsites are pretty much within the main Spitzkopper grounds is first come, first serve. And you really do want to have one of the better campsites. You want to be on the side where the sun, or you don't want the sun hitting you while it's setting. You kind of want to be behind the hills because it is damn hot. Um, but then also you want to be close to the famous arch in this area. And this arch is what most people are attracted to to come and photograph. But we arrived early enough, got a really great campsite right beneath this arch, which was really cool. Um, and we positioned our tents. As you came out in the morning, you could you looked straight into that arch, which was really, really cool. Um, but we arrived early we set up camp. I started cooking out dinner for that night because we wouldn't have really had much time in the afternoon or that night because Spitzkop is very much an afternoon shoot and nighttime shoot because then it cools down enough, your sun's at the right angle, you get the best light, and then obviously at night you get the astro type shots that everyone or any keen and avid photographer would wish for. But the scale of this place is unbelievable. Um, and again, here, having people in your scene really adds massive value to um, the shot. Easy to clone out if you want. But then also, if you're patient enough and these people move off, you still get your shots of these beautiful peaks and these rock formations and this arch with no one in them. Um, and it's a, oh man, it's such a great great place to be and definitely a, a must a must visit it's a great place to hike around walk around and you can spend a couple of of days there um, but i would recommend nothing more than two nights in in spitzkopper but we only did the one night to photograph that arch do some astrophotography and then from there we made our way to twaifelfontein um country lodge which is further north it's about a three hour 40 minute drive and that took a good part of our day we got there quite early, but we had no activities planned there because we'd, we'd had quite a few days of on the go. So our night at Twaifelfontein Country Lodge was literally just kind of resorting and repacking bags, um, getting everything ready for the next day. We also spent some time at the pool relaxing, looking at some images, editing some images that we took on the previous days. And the reason why I said we needed to kind of resort our bags is because the next day we woke up nice and early and we drove a 40 minute drive from Twaifelfontein Country Lodge after breakfast to Doronawas, which is only about a 30 to 40 minute drive slightly further north. And this is where our vehicle would be parked and we'll stay for the next four nights because stopped our vehicle there in the designated parking area for their guests. We then gave our bags to um, the staff members, and we then sat down and waited for our flight out to Honeb Skeleton Coast Camp. Um, and as I'd mentioned, we, our flight out of Doronawas, they've got the airstrip right on their doorstep. It's their own private airstrip. And at about midday, we took our flight out to um, Honeb Skeleton Coast Camp and it is. It was so cool to be in this tiny aircraft and see the landscape change from this rusty, rocky, kind of mountainous Damara land type landscape um, closer towards. And as you get closer to Honeb, you get more of this kind of cacao felt, which is like your harsh desert type environment 
which drifts between sand dunes and more spaced out kind of rocky outcrops and hills. And so a nice easy 40 minute flight in. And as you land, it's about a 15 minute drive to camp. And the camp is situated also in a perfect and very well kind of strategized area um, where you kind of, the whole lodge and all the rooms are kind of blocked and I wouldn't call it shaded, um, but kind of hunkered in amongst these rocky hills, um, which overlook um, the slope down towards kind of the Honeb Valley floor or riverbed, this Honeb Valley towards the Honeb um, riverbed, which is a massive highway for animals moving to and fro. Um, and all the rooms are alloc- or situated perfectly in this kind of horseshoe type shape that everyone has an equal and cool view of um, the surrounding area. Really well kitted out rooms, stunning, stunning rooms. Um, because it's a desert and can get quite hot and or quite warm, they're designed beautifully to kind of keep it cool and or warm um, throughout the day and night. Um, and they all kind of overlook a nice watering hole at the camp. And when we arrived, we had um, giraffe drinking, um, which was really special. But then after our coast tour that we did, which I'll chat a bit more about in a short while, um, we had the whole afternoon in camp and we were the only two people while the others were out on drive. And we even had a sighting of a brown hyena coming in towards the watering hole, lay in there, drank water, and then made her way literally along the side of the camp, along the rooms, and passed in the way. Um, Which that in itself was also a big... um, highlight moment for us because we both really wanted to see brown ahina and having had this brown ahina to ourselves that afternoon super relaxed allowed us to photograph it and kind of move and walk around and didn't just bolt off was really really special and that said the game viewing you'd think in the middle of a desert is not something that would kind of blow your mind well it blew our mind i knew that that honeb river um, there's still a lot of groundwater there. The trees are green, so there's a lot of life along that strip. But I didn't know it would be as productive as it was for us during our time there. Um, when we were flying out from Doronawas, we were speaking to one of the managers who was coming back into camp, Lazelle, amazing lady, um, and she's got an incredible team. I mean, that I don't think I've ever, in any of the lodges I've stayed, seen attention to detail than that particular team they knew every single thing about us it was insane they remembered everything um and it was really a great stay at doranau uh, at um Honep. but like i said as we were flying out or just before we were chatting to lizelle and beata told her yes i would really love to see cheetah in the desert that would be really special and we all know that it, it's a super 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 rare animal to see out there not often seen um, and Lizelle said, well, she has heard that there's been a cheetah around, but usually a cheetah is kind of in the area for a day and then gone. And we arrived. We told Ben, our guide, who was also an absolute legend, that cheetah is high up on the wish list. He's like, cool, he'll try his best. And we made our way out of camp. Now, there's two ways you can get down to the river. You can't go straight out of camp and down the valley into the river. You need to go around the two hills either the eastern or the western side. And we took the eastern side that afternoon. We looked at some um, rocks and some plants and some interesting stuff because it was still really hot. And we made our way into the riverbed. And it was literally about 20 to 30 minutes in. We were driving along this river, 20 to 30 minutes into our first game drive. Ben like stops the vehicle and he's like, there, 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 there. And this female cheetah sitting on a dune looking at us behind these big, like this broken down tree sitting there looking at us. And it was such a breathtaking moment um, to have found this cheetah in the dunes. And Piat and I were beside ourselves. We didn't know what was going on. But this animal was quite hungry. So we saw her in various different areas, lying up on rocky little outcrops, still on sand dunes, trying to cool off. But the backdrops were absolutely breathtaking. We then had her walking around. And as I said, she was hungry. Walking along these dunes, we got so many great photographic opportunities with her. She was hunting, chasing, stenbok around, looking for something to eat. Um, and then fortunately, the very next day when we were tracking lions, she had managed to kill not one, but two 
Springbuck. Um, she was a little bit shy around her carcass, so we decided to just give her space and not push her too much because they obviously cheetah in the best of environments really struggle um, with stress and pressure. So we decided we're just going to uh, steer clear and not pressure her too much. So we just got a bit of images and footage of her feeding and then we made our way. But how awesome that was, I cannot even begin to explain. To see cheetah moving through and hunting in the dunes absolute highlight moment for me um but not only that there were so many animals out there so many animals out there um from Stenbock, they were like everywhere out there but to your giraffe walking across these dunes um i mean you can put anything in this in the scene and it's going to look amazing we had baboons going crazy running down the banks of the um the dry river like falling on their faces oryx running through and along the river and obviously everything spends their time, a lot of their time, in that riverbed because it's cooler, there's green vegetation to eat, um, and it really is heaving with life. There's life everywhere along that river, the Honab River. Um, and then if you ever stay there and you make your way further um, west towards the coastline, you will also see all the seals, like literally all and one more seal in that area, um, in the Maui Bay region. I will chat more about the coastline in a bit, but that's a really, really cool experience. But speaking of really cool things and things that we really wanted to also see in this area were elephant and lion. And we kind of knew that these desert-adapted elephant and lion were elephant more so than lion, kind of a given. Um, but that first afternoon, the first morning, no elephant around, no lion around, but we had the cheetah, which was insane. Um but then we got a call as we went out on afternoon safari. Uh, oh, no, sorry. I lied. It was late that first, that morning, that second morning, um, that elephants are drinking water at the watering hole at camp. So everything frequents that thing. It's like we had giraffe there. We had brown ahina. We had lions there one night. Um, and then we obviously had the um, baboons in there. Um, the light. What was it? Oh, the elephant now. Um so a lot of things, water is life out in that place. And seeing that they pump water at the, the lodge, everything comes there, which is great. Um, anyway, but we had this call saying that elephants are at the watering hole. And we made our way up onto the bank. And we kind of approached it. We could see camp in the back. And the elephants already were coming out away from the water, busy feeding. Um, some of them were dusting, which was absolutely beautiful. The dust out there kind of floats and flies through the air like, dust nowhere else does it is absolutely beautiful but the big highlight and another thing we actually saw at the at the airstrip was um an image well there's these these big boards around the entire um uh what would you call it you can't call it a terminal just a place where you sit but big boards with information on desert adapted elephants, desert adapted lions, the research and all that kind of stuff. And there was one image of an elephant coming down a bank, super dusty, and another one kind of coming at opposite angle above it. And Beata still said, geez, I would love to get a shot like this. So after these elephants had dusted, Ben, our guide, said there is a place where they often come down if they take the correct route. So let's go around and go and sit down in the riverbed, which we then did. And there was this beautiful, as you see, like perfect little path for these elephants to, to come down. And we had this whole herd come down there. So it was three females, three calves, and then this big bull all walked down this channel, kicking up dust, giving us various photographic opportunities, opportunity enough to take video. And then right at the very end, this male elephant decided to be a clown and <laughs> go down um, on his back knees, which was a really fun experience and something that uh, really stood out to us. And we were super happy that we were able to um, get the shot that Beata had seen at the terminal building and said, geez, you know, I really want a photograph like that. And then another animal that I'd mentioned is the lion, that we really wanted to see desert-adapted lion. And we got to see Charlie, she was a lioness in the area a number of times, but by herself. Her sisters had made their way further west towards the coast, 
and there was a new male introduced to the area in February. So he was a little bit shy and acting a little bit strange. But eventually we got to see what his name is, OP. So I don't know what that means, but OP, a really good looking male lion. Um, and by the time we had seen him, we were very lucky that he had already kind of become quite used to the presence of vehicles and he understands that we don't want to hurt him. Um, but his main target was to fo um, focus on on Charlie and follow her around because they were mating when we got to, to spend some time with them. So that was really fun. Um, and as I said, we had Charlie a few times by herself. We had Charlie and Opie together, walking together, mating. But I think the highlight moment with them was probably the very last morning where we found them at sunrise. That was stunning. That was absolutely beautiful having them walking towards us. And then from that point onwards, they picked up on a herd of springbuck coming towards them. They were lying in the middle of the river, close to this massive tree. And eventually, like we, we waited, and this was our last morning, we waited there forever. And eventually these springbuck decided to make their way closer. This drew the attention of the cats and the hunt was on. It was very close, um, but sadly, they missed, didn't happen, but then we had a really cool photograph of these lions in the dust with the morning um, sun rays hitting this dust. It was really stunning. Um, but on the lion front, we had really good luck there, but what we were also really hoping for, so there were three things we were really hoping for, one being cheetah, the lion or the elephant coming down a dusty hill like that, and then thirdly, lions in massive sand dunes or on the coast further west. Now, at Honeb Skeleton Coast Camp, I think if you stay three nights or longer, or three nights, you get if your trip to the coast is included. Um, if you stay there for only two nights or one night, you'd have to pay additional cost to get to the coast because it's quite a logistical thing, which I'll get to. Um, but obviously, with us being there longer than three nights, we had a night, uh, a night or a day's tour to the coast. So that was another or hope for us is to find lions on the dunes out there and we found tracks of them we these beautiful dunes like with these what looked like little paths running down them and these lion tracks two sisters heading further west towards there's a massive oasis there, there's huge body of water and greenery um they were walking towards that and our hopes were that they went there and kept making their way towards the coast where they would be hunting seals sadly we didn't get to see that because Ben, our guide, believes that they probably killed an oryx or a springbok or something close to that oasis where that big body of water is in literally the middle of the desert. Um, and that's where they'd be hunkered for a few days because they're obviously getting good food. They're getting enough moisture from the blood from the animal, but then also the oasis is right there. They're getting good fresh water. Um, so we didn't see the lion out on the dunes, but we saw their tracks, but still a great experience. But that's a whole day out. You leave camp at 7 and you just drive west all the way you go through the floodplains um, and then eventually you get to the coastline that's where we saw the seal colony while we were in the dunes we were um, our guide ben was showing us how to look for various different geckos or lizards or mice or um, things like that in the dunes which when you're driving through there you think there's no life out here it's absolutely dead but then he'll stop and he'll be like oh look I've, i see this little hole with a bit of sand kicked up here Let's go look there. And then he starts digging and he finds this little gecko or this um, um, shovel-snouted lizard or whatever it was called. So a really cool experience to be out there and learn and see a lot more of the smaller desert life out there. Um, but then once you get through to the edge of the or to the coastline, you get to see um, an area where there was an old shipwreck. You get to see all the seals plus one. And oh, that smells bad, but really cool to spend time with so many seals and photographing that colony. And then a bit further um, north or south down the coastline, they set up a beautiful table with your private chef that's there because your chef leaves camp with you and you drop her off somewhere in the dunes with another vehicle. This guy then takes her to the lunch spot. Um, but sets up a beautiful lunch on the coastline and it is, it's just such a great experience. We had the best seafood paella you can ever imagine. Um, but then from that point onwards, you have your lunch, and then from there, the airstrip's about a 20-minute drive back to the airstrip along the coast where you then sit and wait for your plane uh, to come in because it's a long drive out. Like I said, you leave at 7, 
we because we obviously photographing along the way it took us a little bit longer but usually you get back to camp at about two thirty, three o'clock in the afternoon we got back slightly later because we took longer to get there but as i said you then make your way to um the airstrip your plane then picks you up and you fly back myself beata and the chef flew back to camp Ben then has to drive, obviously, his vehicle all the way back to camp. And that's why you don't really have um, an afternoon activity uh, in terms of going out on safari because Ben is very far away. Your guide's very far away. Um, but what is offered is there is a research project for brown ahina and lion at Honeb, which that is your activity for the afternoon. You can sit in and listen to a presentation that is provided by either the lion and or um, hyena researchers. Beata was very tired. It was a long day. She opted out. But with us sitting, relaxing, just looking at pictures at the deck at the main area of the lodge, that's where Beata then spotted this brown hyena that we got to to spend time with. So even though we didn't go out on safari and we also opted out of the presentation and because the researchers were quite busy, um, and Beata was feeling a bit tired. We got great time with a brown hyena. That was very, very special. And speaking of very special things, um, the su- any every single sunrise there and every single sunset was it just hit differently. It is a a very special place, and the colours and the how long those colours last are insane. And the dust in that area when the animals move just adds so much value. But I think the most special moment, to me at least, the Ahina look was insane. That was awesome. But on our last evening, we saw something really, really cool. Sorry, I lie. It wasn't our last evening. It was our last second to last morning. We were tracking down the lioness and the lion, the, the two, the mating pair. And we got a call from one of Ben's colleagues that he's just found a caracal. So we decided, well, flip, let's go and look at that. Made our way there and en route there, (coughs) excuse me, en route there, we figured, or we heard that this thing went into thick bush. And we're like, damn, we now are missing out on this. Um, But Ben said, no, it's still early enough. Let's make our way there. Let's go check it out. It could still move when that vehicle moves out the area. So we did this. We drove there, got to the area. We saw the bush it went into where this vehicle had stopped. And we slowly started driving around each bush and we could pick up the tracks. And Ben was tracking this thing. He saw cats into that bush and we drove there, went around that bush. It came out here and he was looking at this ground level, ground level the whole time looking for tracks. And he was doing such a good job in following this cat. I decided, well, I'm not going to track this cat any better than he is. I'm just going to scan far out to see if I can see movement. And eventually, this thing was moving closer towards this mountain range. And eventually, I just saw this movement. And I said, Ben, Ben, what's that? What's that? And he stops the vehicle, and we looked with binoculars, and it's this caracal. So we slowly made a big loop towards it. And we had a bit of time with it on ground level on the at the base of this mountain or this rocky outcrop. Eventually, it decided to climb up it. And then it gave us such a show because it would walk up the side of the mountain, stop, turn, look at us walk up to another spot, sit down, hunker down. And it just gave us such a great opportunity to photograph this cat as it was moving along the side of this mountain. Because at one point it went over and Ben said, no, let's go around. Went around. Then we had it walking along the sides. It got into this like valley area where there was sand going up onto the side. It walked into that perfect silhouette moment. And, oh, geez, that was absolutely incredible. And the fact that it was... I was slightly nervous at first, but then it got used to our presence and it just sat there and looked at us and moved and was hunting in the hills looking for something. And that to me was the absolute highlight of the Honeb stay. I mean, everything there was unbelievable, but that caracal moment was something I was not expecting. And um, Ben himself as well was just <laughs> delighted and over the moon with that sighting. Um, so a really cool way to end it off. <coughs> Um, and then yeah, our last morning, as I'd mentioned, we we got to find Charlie and Obi, and they tried to hunt Springbuck and missed that. Um, 
And then, yeah, we flew out a bit later that morning. So we did our full morning activity, got back to camp, and then we made our way out to, and we took pack breakfast every day because usually they do breakfast in camp and then you go out. But we wanted to leave before sunrise, so we took pack breakfast with us. Um, but then, yeah, we flew out straight back to Doronawas where we previously left our vehicle. Um, and we had one night there. One night at Doronawas where we could repack and reorganize everything for our ongoing travels because Beata went on to Uganda for two weeks. I was coming back home. But it was a cool way after like a very kind of normal safari way, like a long full morning, small break, good afternoon activity. So you're quite run down and tired. Um, so it was a cool way just to break it up because the next day we had to make our way to Vintuk, which would have been our longest drive throughout the entire trip, which was about five and a half hours. So a night at Doranawa is beautiful area. There are activities to do there as well, like game drives. You can go look for desert adapted elephants in that area as well. But we opted out of it. We just wanted to relax again, edit some images, resort and pack, have a good dinner and make our way the next morning. So we had our breakfast the next morning, woke up to no water because the elephants had pulled the <coughs> excuse me, had pulled up the water pipes. And we left camp that morning to make our way to Vintuk and we drove into this massive herd of elephant who walked past us and off they went. That was really special. But like I said, about a five and a half hour drive from Doranawas to Vintuk. For the most part, it's Tard Road um, from Korija. So, so I think the first 60 kilometers is dirt. From that point onwards, the rest is tar. From Korijas in towards Vintuk is all tar road. Long drive, but by then you're already so used to sitting in the vehicle and being in the vehicle for many hours. So it really, again, doesn't feel all too long. Beata was sitting editing and looking at some images. We had good music on and we just kind of made our way in. Got to um, Vintuk at about 2.30. Checked in at the Weinberg, which I think probably the best hotel in the entire Namibia. Um, city hotel, if I may. Doesn't feel like Namib or like Africa at all. We said the same about Swakopmund. It feels like Europe. But it felt like we were in like a European city. It's a stunning place with a massive bell tower. Really cool entrance to the hotel. Incredible um, little courtyard. They've got three great restaurants right on the property. One being uh, Cape Town Fish Market. The one being the hotel's restaurant itself. And then just through the bell tower, all like a minute's walk away is the butcher block. Um, so food for kind of everyone. Their rooms are absolutely breathtaking. They've got a rooftop sky lounge where you can sit and enjoy drinks. Um, so a really cool way to, to end not only a long trip, but a long road trip on that particular day. Um, so we checked in nice and early, got the rental vehicle back. They brought me back to the hotel, um, managed to have a nice warm shower, a good early dinner, a glass of wine. And that sadly was the end of the trip, well, for me at least, because I came back home, back in South Africa. And you, um, Beata is actually still currently in Uganda on a tour tracking some chimpanzee and gorilla. But we had a great time in Namibia. We got to see some incredible stuff, um, landscape and animal-wise. We got to eat great food um, throughout the trip. So it really was a fun and awesome way to experience Namibia. And I think it was a great balance between rustic self-drive camping and some really top-level um, kind of service from the wilderness teams at Doranawas and Hona. So if ever you would like to experience Namibia, I've now been there twice. It's a great and very connecting and healing destination. Please feel free to get in touch. I'll happily assist them in answering any questions you may have. Um, but until then, stay happy, stay safe, and chat to you soon. Bye-bye.